Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. As the nation continues to grapple with the fatal shootings of nine black people inside a South Carolina church, the tragedy will forever be part of civil rights history. By all appearances, it was a hate crime targeting African Americans in the historic city of Charleston. The suspect, Dylan Roof, is a 21-year-old white man who reportedly shouted racist comments after sitting with the churchgoers for an hour during their Bible study session. Later, Roof told police he wanted to start a race war. A website registered in his name contained a hate-filled manifesto and photos of Roof holding a Confederate flag. Meanwhile, South Carolina's governor has called for lawmakers to remove the Confederate flag from the Capitol grounds, but others argue the major issue is access to guns and not the Confederate flag. Today we're talking in depth about the impact of this horrific attack. I'm pleased to have as my guests the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, Barbara McQuaid, Reverend Horace Sheffield III of New Destiny Christian Fellowship Church, and Augustine Arblu, who's from the Michigan Civil Rights Commission. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend, I want to start with you because this happened in a church. Mm -hmm. uh, churches are, are supposed to be places uh, that we are safe uh, from, from the outside world and all the awful things. Unfortunately for African Americans, uh, our history hasn't borne that out. You know, churches have been places where we've organized uh, labor movements, civil rights movements, and therefore have always been targets of folks who uh, wanted to forestall our, our future and, and uh, you know, really exacerbate any efforts to organize. You know, one of the things that I think is most amazing, and I, I, you know, from a spiritual standpoint, because there's always some good that can come out of bad, had uh, those uh, families reacted differently. I don't think we even be talking about the removal of the Confederate flag. Is that right? I think that the way that they handled that touched so many people's hearts. I literally cried. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To see such real love and the ethos, you know, Christ died. Right. And through his death, uh, new life was given to many. And through the death of these people, something that people have been trying to do for years. Right. Right. Yeah, people from Detroit go out every year <laughs> trying to remove that flag. Right. Right. And they did it on their own. Yeah. And I think had they responded differently, we wouldn't have seen that happen. Uh, as a pastor, you know, I mean, churches are open to anybody uh, to come in. Does this may give you pause about uh, how safe that is? I've had incidents in my own church. I mean, you have to um, kind of balance the right for people to be there by the safety of the folks who you know are there for the right reason. Yeah. Many churches have far more security unfortunately in my estimation most of it is focused on the protection of the pastor as opposed to the protection of people of the congregation views. sure um, but I had a watch night service and some gentlemen across from ninth precinct came in my church and I knew what they were there for and uh, by the grace of God you know we were able to afford what what happened churches are targets uh, people yeah. come there with money to give money yeah and so there are places that uh, people know take in money every Sunday, just like stores. Right, yeah. right, and they can be targets yes. that way, yeah. Uh, Ms. McQuaid, um, this is a number of things, I think, that, that touch uh, your area. It's a hate crime, uh, it's a civil rights issue, and here we have, uh, again, this issue with guns uh, and the access to guns to, to, to be able to do this. But, but I'm curious, this sort of harkens back to the, to the uh, the work that the Justice Department had to do in the 1960s, protecting people uh, in the South during the, the racial tumult uh, of that decade. Yes, and although um, I think there are p p many people who think that uh, those race wars are over, the Justice Department knows that that really is not true. It's not true. true. And yeah. we have been working on these issues. We work on prevention with these issues uh, to this day. Um, I think a lot of the media attention on terrorism focuses on international terrorism yeah, yeah. Uh, because that's the spectacular and the big planes and things. But the Justice Department has also been focusing on domestic terrorism and hate crimes. And if you look at the actual number of incidents, the hate crimes incidents um, involving uh, Americans hurting other Americans for either a racist agenda or an anti-government agenda, far out numbers yeah. in international terrorist incidents. So we need, know that we need to work on both of those issues, both from an enforcement perspective and a prevention one. And how do you, how do, you do that? What's, what's the prevention end of that look like? I mean, somebody 
like this 21 year old man in South Carolina. Uh, how do you know who that person is or what they intend to do? Well, there's no fail safe and there's no 100% uh, solution. One thing, for example, we're having a uh, hosting a meeting today for pastors um, in Detroit just to talk about ways to protect places of worship. Uh -huh. um, and and as, as, as Reverend she Sheffield talks about, you, there's a real balance there of making sure that houses of worship are open yeah. but safe. So that's one method that we want to do, just preventing the targets from being um, har harmed. But the other is some of the techniques that FBI agents do to find um, people who uh, might be bent on hurting others. You know, in America, you can hate but you can't hurt. Right. And so trying to identify those who are just speaking out their mind and those who might do something else. Um, many times ruses are set up. If someone expresses online a desire to hurt people, uh, sometimes an informant goes in and says, tr tries to uh, elicit what their plans to are. Figure so out what they're doing. Stop before sure. they actually hurt someone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to talk about the gun issue here. Uh, that's something that we talk about here in Detroit all the time. Far too many guns in the hands of people who, who shouldn't have them. Is that is tougher enforcement of uh, uh, gun laws and response to gun crimes one of the things that might prevent this kind of thing from happening? Yeah, I don't know that if you could you could ever prevent this kind of thing from happening. Yeah. And there's certainly other ways people hurt people with bombs and other things, but. Um, we are certainly uh, dedicated to enforcing the gun laws that we have to make sure they stay out of the hands of felons and those with mental illnesses yeah. to try to reduce the number of these kinds of things. And certainly, as you raise, having a gun makes it an awful lot easier to hurt somebody. Sure. Not in this instance, but in other instances, we've seen those big capacity magazines give yes. shooters the capacity to uh, do a lot more damage than they could if they didn't have them. Right, right. Uh, Augie, as you asked me to call you. Uh, uh, let's talk about Michigan versus South Carolina. Right. Uh, this happened in the South. I think a lot of people uh, have, have opinions about what the South is like because of its history. Uh, but these are the kinds of issues that we face here in Michigan Absolutely. too, right? Absolutely, we face these issues, not only in Michigan, but throughout the United States. We can't ignore it. The fact is that, that, that racism is part of our DNA and and that doesn't go away overnight. Uh, we have to think about the underlying causes and we have to think about some of the challenges that we're facing. Yeah. We have inequities in wealth, we have inequities in income and that creates challenges. And then we have another uh, issue a as, as Barbara was commenting, hate crimes are in, an increase. What, what's caused that? Right. And it seems to me that, that the changes that are taking place are a threat. And they're, they're a threat to, to communities, certain communities. And so, for, from some perspective, it could be the white communities, elements within the whites feel threatened by the changes there. When you talk about, place. talk about the changes that you're, that you're referring to there. Well, I, I see, well, first of all, we can't ignore the fact that we have a, a president that is African American. Sure. That's a, a lifetime change. And, and it's something that we should all be proud that we've made some significant progress. But nevertheless, as this man, uh, President Obama was elected, what have we seen? an increase in hate crimes. Yeah. So that means we've got to still address the underlying challenges that we face. Yeah. And what, how do you do that? I mean, what are the well, things you that know, we I've, need to... I've, I've, I've had this discourse about why there's less civility. Yeah. There's less civility because the people who we elect to be civil aren't civil. Right. Well, that's I a mean, good point. I mean, people in public positions yeah. uh, entrench themselves and are partisan. And, and I mean, for a person to disrupt the president's speech, in the wells of Congress, sure. unheard of. Whether it was because he was black, they don't agree with his mm -hmm. political point of view. You know, I tell people all the time, talk, I'm a talk show, so we, we do more damage with words than some folks do yeah. with knives. That's, that's very I mean, true. we do the same thing. We yeah. assassinate characters, uh, you know, we assault people, and then we expect people who are irrational, who don't have the cerebral, you know, right. uh, uh, ability to think through things to act more rational than we do. Yeah. Uh, is it true that hate crimes are, uh, are up since the president was elected? Um, it's difficult to measure because hate crimes are up, but reporting is never very good in the hate crimes okay. arena. 
Hate crimes are up, but 87% of law enforcement agencies report zero hate crimes in their communities, which I think most uh, experts uh, believe is flawed. Mm -hmm. It's just not right. Mm -hmm. But we do see that the highest percentage of hate crimes are hate crimes against African Americans. Yeah. And so this is certainly um, a, a significant threat that uh, the federal government, at least, is very focused on. Yeah, and in this case in South Carolina, if this is deemed a hate crime, what, what are the enhanced penalties uh, that, that Dylan Roof might, might face? Because does it, does, it, does it make it worse for him in court or potentially worse? It, it does. It could expose him to a higher sentence. And I also think hate crime charges in general are important because what it says is it, it requires an additional element, which makes it a little harder for the prosecution to prove. Yeah. In addition to showing that he killed people, you have to show that his motive was uh, based on race. Sure. Although there's certainly evidence here that that was the case. Um, but I think what's important about that is it sends a message to the community that this behavior is not tolerated in our society because when someone commits that kind of crime it's just not those nine people and their families who are impacted it's a whole community and a whole nation yeah. that gets impacted by that so that's why it's important I think to consider those kinds of charges that bring with them those enhanced penalties. Yeah to make that that point. Um, we, we see hate crimes here in Michigan the Michigan Civil Rights Commission I know has been pushing for some changes right in the law that would that would deal with that differently. Well, we, we, we are always are interested in and making changes that provide additional protections to different individuals yeah. different because of race, uh, ethnic, uh, sexual orientation. Sure. And that's one area. That's one where we're LGBT, still fighting about that and still talking fighting about that. how to get to, to a space Coverage. where that's more. And, and that's a challenge and because, uh, as Horace has indicated, we have such uh, the, the, the way of bringing and discussing uh, issues seems to be polarizing. Yeah. We seem to take these very uh, uh, extreme approaches and and allows for for meaningful dialogue. Yeah, and yeah. that has to change. Yeah. Right. Uh, we're going to take a short break. Uh, we'll, when we'll come back, we're going to continue our conversation. Plus, we'll look back at an interview with one of the South Carolina victims that appeared on Detroit Public Television. That's all next right after this look at some important moments in Detroit's black history.